Hello, good evening. Welcome to the John Drew Virtual Theater and tonight's performance of A Sky Full of Poems. Davis Sobel is our friend and guide this evening and has curated a wonderful presentation. I'm Josh Gladstone, Artistic Director of the John Drew Theater at Guild Hall. And it really is a pleasure to see you all. Thank you for tuning in. We have several hundred viewers for tonight's live Zoom presentation. Before we get into the poetry, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize our partners, Hamptons Observatory, uh, who brought this wonderful program idea to Guild Hall, uh, had arranged things with Deva and came to us as their production partner. And we're honored to be working with Hamptons Observatory. I have a special guest who's gonna speak more momentarily about Hamptons Observatory, but I also wanted to invite and encourage you uh, as we now move towards the warmer months that you may be enjoying Zoom as a form of theater. And God knows it's been a, a wonderful thing for all of us in the community, in the performing arts community to have these Zoom productions. We've got another one coming up on Saturday um, featuring work by a playwright and artist in residence at Guild Hall uh, named Ryan Campbell, 7 p.m. Saturday night. We've got a wonderful Zoom presentation coming up Memorial Day that launches Guild Hall's 90th anniversary season. It's called Reawakenings, put together by the actor Paul Heck, and it features more poetry, readings from amazing actors like F. Mary Abraham, Cherry Jones, writers like Salman Rushdie will making uh, appearances, Mercedes Rule, Lynette Freeman, Bill Irwin. It's a truly remarkable cast, and I invite you to tune in for that. But then, if you're Zoomed out, come live to Guild Hall. We've got an amazing roster of shows, live actors, live musicians, live in our backyard theater, starting as soon as April 23rd and 24th with an avant-garde production called Zoetrope, which is an immersive theater piece where audience stares into a New York City apartment that's been built on the back of a trailer through plexiglass windows at the actors inside. And it's a choose your own adventure story. There's, there's 14 performances of Zoetrope coming to the Backyard Theater at Guild Hall at the end of April. And then we have live, we have drive-in films that are gonna be shown at Main Beach in East Hampton. For those of you who are here in East Hampton, uh, Metropolitan Opera, Met Under Moonlight, Tickets are now on sale for that. All of this and more shows with Michael Urie and Mercedes Rule coming this summer to the theater available at our website, guildhall.org. Also an opportunity there to make a donation if you are so inclined. And uh, also speaking of being inclined, I'd like to thank our actors tonight who are joining us. Isaac Klein, who will be reading with us. Nehesayu DeGans will be reading with us. Kate Muth will be reading with us and Laura Hicks will be reading with us. And now without further ado, I'm going to turn the virtual stage over to my colleague, Susan Harder. Susan Harder is a founding member of the board of directors of the Hamptons Observatory. And she's the New York State representative to the International Dark Sky Association. She's a friend of Guild Hall. She's a neighbor of Deva and myself here in Springs, New York. Please welcome Susan Harder. Everyone, uh, good evening. I've been asked to introduce Davis Sobel, truly a person who does not need an introduction because she is our local celebrity here, having written internationally best-selling books on all matters celestial, including Longitude, which was made into a movie starring sexy Jeremy Irons, Galileo's Daughter, with a surprising and wonderful ending, The Glass Universe about early women astronomers, and The Planets with stories about each one, including Pluto. For years, she was a science writer for the New York Times and now is the editor of a full page devoted to poetry for Scientific American magazine, marrying art and science, two disciplines normally not thought of together. And although the magazine previously published poetry, now there will be a full page entitled Meter, edited by Davis Sobel. Personally, and even as a former art dealer, I feel that poetry is truly the highest form of art. David introduced me to my current vocation to protect the night sky by educating the public and municipal officials about the problems and solutions to light pollution. 
that obscures our stars, and also to help establish the Hamptons Observatory. We provide free lectures and programs to view the night sky, and we encourage everyone during this, which is the International Dark Sky Week, to turn off unnecessary lighting and look up at the star-filled night sky here and to be inspired. So, Deva, it's your show. Thank you, Susan. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, poetry lovers. Welcome, astronomers. I think that covers everybody. Friends of the Hamptons Observatory, friends of Guild Hall, personal friends, hello, family, colleagues, distinguished guests. I'm glad you're here, and I'm eager to share a sky full of poems with all of you. For a little over a year now, I have been editing a poetry column in Scientific American, and several of the poems you will hear tonight appeared first in that column, which is called meter, a term that refers to rhythm in poetry, but also to scientific measurement. And that's what the poems do. They talk about some scientific phenomenon from a poet's point of view. My friend uh, Galileo uh, was a great lover of poetry and memorized huge sections of poems by poets he admired. Um, he also wrote poetry. And uh, you're probably thinking, well, Italy in the wake of the Renaissance, but actually there are contemporary astronomers who write poetry, and we will hear some of that tonight. Um, we have all kinds of astronomers with us. Most of the people in the Hamptons Observatory are amateurs, of course, but even among amateurs, people get excited about different things. So we have lunatics who like to observe the mountains and craters on the moon. And then we have people who hate the moon because when it's really bright, it blots out the deep sky objects that they want to observe. But we have planetary enthusiasts, eclipse chasers, even some radio astronomers, X-ray astronomy, gravitational wave astronomy. These are beyond the scope of the backyard hobbyist, but they are fair game for poets. And almost everyone can be a stargazer under the right circumstances. Clear dark sky on a summer night, or even, even in an armchair. You can be an armchair astronomer, someone who likes to read about it or think about the universe. So we'll, we'll start there with the armchair astronomer. And in this case, it's former US poet laureate, Billy Collins. And Isaac will start us off by reading, as if to demonstrate an eclipse by Billy Collins. I pick an orange from a wicker basket and place it on the table to represent the sun. Then, down at the other end, a blue and white marble becomes the earth. And nearby, I lay the little moon of an aspirin. I get a glass from a cabinet, open a bottle of wine. Then I sit in a ladder back chair, a benevolent god presiding over a miniature creation myth. And I begin to sing a homemade canticle of thanks for this perfect little arrangement, for not making the earth too hot or cold, not making it spin too fast or slow, so that the grove of orange trees and the owl become possible, not to mention the rolling wave, the play of clouds, geese in flight, and the Z of lightning on a dark lake. Then I fill my glass again, and give thanks for the trout, the oak, and the yellow feather, singing the room full of shadows as sun and earth and moon circle one another in their impeccable orbits, 
and I get more and more cockeyed with gratitude. Very nice, thank you. The moon is of course our nearest celestial neighbor, close enough to observe fairly easily and even to visit. And I bet that all of you who are as old as I am remember exactly where you were and what you were doing in July 1969 when the eagle landed in the sea of tranquility and the Apollo astronauts walked on the moon. It all seems kind of historic long ago now, even old hat, but at the time it was utterly strange to see them just float hopping around that rocket ship on another world. Poet Elizabeth Alexander was only seven years old in the summer of 1969. And in July, she was on a road trip with her family. So they couldn't watch the moon landing at home on their own television and were just stopping here and there to catch the highlights. And that experience stayed with her through the many, many things she's done since, which include teaching poetry for 15 years at Yale University, where she was also chair of the African American Studies program. And she also got to read aloud a poem of hers at the very special occasion of the inauguration of President Barack Obama. And now Nehesayu will read for us Apollo by Elizabeth Alexander. We pull off to a road shack in Massachusetts to watch men walk on the moon. We did the same thing for three, two, one, blast off. And now we watch the same men bounce in and out of craters. I want a Coke and a hamburger. Because the men are walking on the moon, which is now irrefutably not green, not cheese, not a shiny dime floating in cold blue the way I thought. The road shack people don't notice we are a black family, not from there, the way it mostly goes. This talking through static bounces in space boots, tethered to cords is much stranger, stranger even than we are. Lovely, thank you. The moon is the cause of the phenomenon of the total solar eclipse. So our moon is only one four hundredth the size of the sun, but it's 400 times closer to us. So that makes them look exactly the same size in our sky. And the moon can sometimes just blot out the light we're accustomed to seeing from the sun and expose the usually invisible sections of the sun's outer atmosphere. The first time I saw that happen, which was in Mexico in 1991, I thought I had witnessed a miracle. And I've seen other eclipses since, and I can tell you the thrill does not diminish. The last eclipse I saw was the so-called Great American Eclipse of August 21st, 2017. 
And that cut a path from Oregon all the way to South Carolina, viewed by multitudes. And one of the people standing that day under the shadow of the moon was poet, nature writer, and University of Arizona English professor, Christopher Kokinos. He, he was what the diehards call an eclipse virgin. And in his poem, he was able to explain the science of what was happening and his emotional response to it. And now Laura will read for us Eclipse by Christopher Kokinos. That we need the sky to tell us we don't matter is why before totality, we are so giddy and akimbo. In its random masking, how shall the sun disclose its other light? We've not seen before. And strange air, dark and gray and silver and soft and very precise emerges to pool around every pore and shiver of skin. Beneath our breathy hollers, a river runs dark. Sprays of pebble, leaping riffles, instantly aloft. Corona crowns the south, whole edged with brimming sprays of light. What is metaphor but secular alchemy? Black, flat sphere, five degrees off the ecliptic, else each month we'd see totality. Normal as a door, common as a starling. Above little lost river, above the valley and its ranges, above thrall, dumb totality. And the moon slips away unseen three millimeters monthly and so on, et cetera, until its visage will shirk this scene. Orbits bloat. Eclipses are happenstance, like us, they'll go extinct. The moon to be debris someday, a lovely ring around a dead earth. But ah, among the living, crickets. At noon, and humans hooting with an owl looking for a gopher, or at the light around the moon. Pink crust flares like fire mountains, like sleep to rub from the cyclops eye before his hot day at the forge. There is light around the moon, white. Corona, a hand of streaming cilia that warns and beckons, the rim brightens, and fact makes terror wonderful. I, I'm ready for the next one. Uh, there will be another great American eclipse on April 8th. 2024, and it is not too soon to make your travel plans. Uh, Chris Kokinos, who wrote that poem, joined with his colleague at the University of Arizona Poetry Center to edit this collection, Beyond Earth's Edge, The Poetry of Spaceflight. And it was in this book that I first encountered the poem that we are, we are going to hear next. Some people who witnessed the Apollo moon landings found them more than strange. In fact, utterly unbelievable. Some people even thought the whole thing had been a hoax carried out in the desert. And some people felt that the act of walking on the moon had been sacrilegious, a, a desecration that clashed with their deepest religious beliefs. Poet and performer Patricia Smith was a teenager in the time of the Apollo missions and she found it wonderfully exciting and could practically picture herself as an astronaut. But her mother had a completely different response. 
and she wrote a poem about it. And Nehesayu will read for us, Annie Pearl Smith Discovers Moonlight by Patricia Smith. My mother, the sage of Aliceville, Alabama, didn't believe that men had landed on the moon. They can do anything with cameras, she hissed, to anyone and everyone who'd listen, even as moon rock crackled beneath Neil Armstrong's puffed boot, while the gritty film spun and rewound and we heard the snarl static of one small step, my mother pouted and sniffed and slammed skillets into the sink. She was not impressed. After all, it was 1969, a year fat with deceit. So many miracles had proven mere staging for lesser dramas. But why this elaborate prank staged in a desert somewhere out west where she insisted the cosmic gag unfolded? They are trying to fool us. No one argued since she seemed near tears, remembering the nervy deceptions of her own skin, mirrors that swallowed too much, men who blessed her with touch only as warning, a woman reduced to juices, sensation and ritual. My mother saw the stars only as signals for sleep. She had already been promised the moon. And heaven too, Somewhere above her head, she imagined bubble-cheeked cherubs lining the one and only road to salvation, angels with porcelain faces and celestial choirs wailing gospel brown enough to warp the seams of paradise. But for heaven to be real, it could not be kissed, explored, strolled upon, or crumbled in the hands of living men. It could not be the 10 o'clock news, the story above the fold, the breathless garble of a radio special report. My mother had twisted her tired body into prayerful knots, worked 20 years in a candy factory, dipping wrinkled hands into vats of lumpy chocolate and counted out dollars with her thin doubled vision so that a heavenly seat would be plumped for her coming. Now the moon, the promised land's brightest bauble crunched plainer than sidewalk beneath ordinary feet. And her Lord just letting it happen. Ain't nobody mentioned God in all this, she muttered over a hurried dinner of steamed collars and cornbread. That's how I know they ain't up there. Them stars, them planets ain't ours to mess with. The Lord would have showed himself of them men done punched a hole in my heaven. Daddy kicked my foot beneath the table. We nodded, we chewed, we swallowed. Inside me, thrill unraveled. I imagine my foot touching down on the jagged rock, blessings moving like white light through my veins. Annie Pearl Smith rose from sleep that night and tilted her face full toward a violated paradise. My father told me how she whispered in tongues, how she ached for a sign she wouldn't have to die to believe. Now I watch her clicking like a clock toward deliverance. And I tell her that heaven still glows wide and righteous with a place waiting just for her, fashioned long ago by that lumbering dance of feet both human and holy. Wow, thank you. After the sun and the moon, Venus is the brightest celestial object in our sky. And it's bright for a few reasons. It's close, it's the closest planet. And it's also completely enshrouded by clouds 
that are reflective. And so the sun that hits Venus gets radiated back into space. And uh, for those reasons, Venus is the object most frequently reported to police and highway patrols as a UFO. Uh, Robert Frost riffed on the brightness of Venus in a very long poem with a long title and an even longer subtitle. The subtitle is A Dated Popular Science Medley on a Mysterious Light Recently Observed in the Western Sky at Evening. Now, Isaac will read to us the opening section of the poem, The Literate Farmer and the Planet Venus by Robert Frost. I stopped to compliment you on this star. You get the beauty of from where you are. To see it so, the bright and only one in sunset light, you'd think it was the sun that hadn't sunk the way it should have sunk, but right in heaven was slowly being shrunk. So small as to be virtually gone, yet there to watch the darkness coming on like someone dead permitted to exist enough to see if he was greatly missed. I didn't see the sunset. Did it set? Will anybody swear that isn't it? Sweet, thank you. I am happily on the receiving end of all sorts of solar system kitsch. This, this is a card a friend sent me. These are my planet shower hooks, gift from my daughter. Uh, here's a roll of tape that has planets on it. Saturn bookmark. I have an endless appetite for this stuff and I'm not alone. I once got to visit Neil deGrasse Tyson in his office at the planetarium and he has a huge collection. Uh, th this is not to scale, but we are the third rock from the sun. Mars is the fourth. And because we're closer, we go around a lot faster. We actually make two complete orbits of the sun in the time it takes Mars to make one. And some of that time we're very far apart. We're on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other. But at other times when we catch up and overtake Mars on our inside track, we get really close. And that is an excellent time to launch a spacecraft to Mars or to view Mars through the telescope. And uh, often uh, big observatories will invite the public in for a, for a Mars close approach. And um, not all close approaches are equal. Some of them are much closer than others. Uh, for example, in 2003, there was a close approach that was widely publicized because it was the closest the planets had been in more than 60,000 years. And our next poem is about a family visit to an observatory on that occasion. So Laura will read for us Three Views of Mars by Jessica Goodfellow. Though I have spent most of today wiping my baby's bottom, raw from a bout of diarrhea, tonight we will wait until deep darkness, rouse the sick child and his pajama-clad brother, and go to the observatory to see Mars. I will hold my older son up to the telescope, praying that this time he won't swing it away from the red planet and toward the appalled graduate students who will have to reset it, not an inconsequential matter. 
I'll say to my son, do you see the big red star? And he'll answer, I don't know. He's three. I don't know could mean yes or no, or I have my eyes closed like last time. It might even mean that he is already night blind, the first symptom of retinitis pigmentosa, the disease blinding his father. I will help my husband onto the footstool behind the telescope, guide his cheek to the eyepiece, but I won't ask if he sees anything. Is it really red? He'll want to know. I'll consider. It only looks to me slightly more orange than the other yellow white stars visible. But red is the last color my husband lost before everything went monochrome, except it was really purple. He was seeing as red. Yes, I tell him. A vivid red. My husband is not quite blind yet. His field of vision always narrowing, he sees as though through the center of a knot slowly tightening. These days it is like looking through the band of my wedding ring held about three inches from my face. We will stagger back to the car in darkness, the feverish baby slumped and dozing over my shoulder. The three-year-old hinged to my knee, my husband clamped to my free arm. We are like, one grotesque organism, a lost and limping monster, an alien unequipped for life on earth. And I'll narrate as we walk, curb in three paces, a hydrant to the right, lone jogger heading straight at you. And after we put the boys to bed, my husband will lie down next to me and say, the closest in 66,000 years. I'm so glad we didn't miss anything. Outside, Mars is already receding. A pinhole of light getting ever smaller until it is gone. Beautiful. Thank you. That poem comes from this collection by Jessica Goodfellow. Uh, Jessica is with us tonight. She actually lives in Japan now, but Zoom makes such things possible. Uh, our next poet is the author of this collection, Donna Kane, who is with us uh, from her home in Canada. And Ori is almost entirely devoted to the Pioneer 10 spacecraft, which was launched in 1972 as the first mission to the outer planets. So it was the first spacecraft to navigate the asteroid belt. And it took the first close up pictures of Jupiter and its moons. And by now, it is way gone beyond the familiar planets and was last heard from in 2003. Uh, but one of the poems in Ori is a tribute to the suite of 11 instruments that flew on Pioneer 10. And each stanza of this poem consists of the letters of a particular instrument turned into anagrams. You'll, you'll hear it when the ensemble takes turns reading about the various Pioneer 10 Instruments by Donna Kane. One, Geiger Tube Telescope. Score big, little letter to Eros. Recoup our loss, toll our bells, be us. Two, ultraviolet photometer. Pill through a velvet throat. Earth trove larvae, little limpet. 
Three, imaging photopolarimeter. The heart agape at hope to romp, to tramp the grime, to glitter all the portage home. Number four, meteoroid detectors. To some, I mirror terror. To some, terror mirrors me. Some mirror me to meet terror. Me, I recede. Five, Sisyphus asteroid meteoroid detector. Meteors are so rare. Distracted is a dead idea. Say I'm morose, I am. Address me as tractor. Address me as droid. Address me. Six, helium vector magnetometer. Am I liminal? Am I the unmoving mover? One trail, no haim to churn, not meant to turn or change or veer or unravel? Gone, the human ear to hear me count, each nettle in the magnetic glue. One minute, I am a marvel. One minute, I am not a thing. Seven, quadraspherical plasma analyzer. Media zeal slipped a quaalude all splashy launch and salad days nailed a crippled calm. Eight, charged particle instrument. NASA pinged me. I pinged NASA, a space addict's dream, until the anesthesia set in, and then not a clear sailing past thin haired mammals, rue, pain, and mincemeat pies. Nine, trapped radiation detector. A nation ordered portion. Part pride, part corporation. Dapper dart to dear departed tin pot. 10, cosmic ray telescope. Slip me some Sartre, carol me to sleep. Oh, mossless trail. 11, infrared radiometer. I am doomed. No Martian, no red end to refer to. Do I dream? I dream. I dream of terra firma. I dream of dirt. P.S. Home antenna pointed. I recorded data and quietly retired. Retired quietly and data recorded. I pointed antenna home. Hello, everyone. That, that was great. I, I muted myself, which was good because I was laughing a lot, but then I didn't unmute. Um, the, uh, the Pioneer 10 is not coming back. It, uh, it was not designed as a sample return mission, although we have those now. But sometimes, little pieces of space just arrive at Earth without our having to go and retrieve them. This is the Canyon Diablo meteorite. It landed about 50,000 years ago in what is now Arizona. Uh, these are not at all rare. And um, perhaps you can see it has a, a nice shiny striated pattern. These are etched with acid to clean them up. And then you can see where the iron and nickel crystallized in the tremendous heat as the rock descended through the Earth's atmosphere. Other kinds of interplanetary visitors come by, but they don't land. So they might just swing around the sun and make a nice display. 
like Halley's Comet, which comes round about every 75 years. And some of you here tonight will see its return in 2061. And I hope for your sake that that proves to be a stupendous vision. Um, much loved poet Stanley Kunitz, who died in, 19, in, in 2006 at the age of 100, lived long enough to see Halley's Comet twice, in 1910 and again in 1986. And the first time was the much more memorable. And he wrote a poem about it, which Josh will read for us now, Halley's Comet by Stanley Kunitz. Miss Murphy in first grade wrote its name in chalk across the board and told us it was roaring down the storm tracks of the Milky Way at frightful speed. And if it wandered off its course and smashed into the earth, there'd be no school tomorrow. A red bearded preacher from the hills with a wild look in his eyes stood in the public square at the playground's edge, proclaiming he was sent by God to save every one of us, even the little children. Repent, ye sinners, he shouted waving his hand-lettered sign. At supper, I felt sad to think that it was probably the last meal I'd share with my mother and my sisters. But I felt excited too, and scarcely touched my plate. So mother scolded me and sent me early to my room. The whole family is asleep, except for me. They never heard me steal into the stairwell hall and climb the ladder to the fresh night air. Look for me, father, on the roof of the red brick building at the foot of Green Street. That's where we live, you know on the top floor. I'm the boy in the white flannel gown sprawled on this coarse gravel bed, searching the starry sky, waiting for the world to end. Oh, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we had a comet visitor last summer, Comet Pan Stars, and some of the Hamptons Observatory people were out with their telescopes, helping others get a good look at it. I am bad with equipment, so I don't. I don't have a telescope. I. I have. I have this really just for sentimental reasons, because I like the way it looks. It was a gift from my brother. But you don't need to have a telescope to get spectacular images of the heavens because you have the People's Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched in 1990, but went through planning and building for long years before that. And the next poet on our program, Tracy K. Smith, practically grew up with the Hubble because her father was one of the engineers who prepared it for its mission. And because of that personal background, she felt a, a sense of shame when the initial images came back blurred. But as you may recall, and this is evident now, that problem was very quickly and ingeniously resolved. Uh, Tracy K. Smith is a recent US Poet Laureate, 2017 to 2019. 
and her book, uh, Life on Mars from Grey Wolf Press um, is the collection that won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. And our next poem comes from that collection. And Nehesayu will read it for us. It's My God, It's Full of Stars by Tracy K. Smith. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons, scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold, a bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di. Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time the optics jibed, we saw to the edge of all there is. So brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. Beautiful, thank you. Two of the most iconic images from the Hubble Space Telescope are the pillars of creation that show active star birth in the Eagle Nebula and the 1995 Hubble Deep Field, which proved that even seemingly empty patches of space were with galaxies. Our next poem celebrates that image, the Hubble Deep Field, and the confidence and courage of, of the astronomer, Dr. Robert Williams, who took that chance on what might have been a completely fruitless observation devoting hours of the telescope's coveted time to looking at nothing. And Isaac will read for us, Staring at Nothing by Wyatt Townley. What are you staring at? Said the mother, said the cousin, said the teacher to the child. Nothing, he said. Then his wife asked, Nothing, nothing and more nothing and nothing more. What a waste of time, said his colleagues, valuable time. People would kill for that. One December for 10 nights and a hundred hours, he stared at nothing. He looked at where there wasn't anything but nothing, more nothing, and nothing more, nothing but death and birth merging into light, collisions of blue, red, yellow, white, spirals, ellipticals, nothing but the universe quintupling in size. What wasn't 
is teeming with galaxies, gleaming innumerably. It's nothing, said he. Look at nothing to see. Oh, it's great. Thank you. Uh, this is how the poem looked when it appeared in the December 2020 issue of Scientific American, uh, which was the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Deep Field. And when we got these lovely broadsides from the printer, I asked Wyatt Townley if she had shared the poem with Robert Williams uh, since she had dedicated it to him and she hadn't. So I took that on myself and you'll not be surprised to learn he was absolutely thrilled. It's not every day a working astronomer has someone write a poem about him. And um, he was so tickled, he asked her to provide a signed copy, which he is having framed and plans to put on display in the Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, our next poem comes from the person who first introduced me to science poetry, my very dear friend, Diane Ackerman. When we met in 1973, she was working on this book. She was a graduate student at Cornell and I was science writer in the University News Bureau. And one of my colleagues had interviewed her about her project and then put us together because we obviously had a lot in common. Diane had convinced Carl Sagan to spend an hour a day with her in, in a private tutorial about planetary science so she could write a cycle of poems about the solar system. And this, this is the very copy that she sent me three years later when the book was published. It's a, a treasured possession. And Diane, more than anyone else I know, it longs for contact with beings who are not earthlings. And this, this is a, a theme of, of her work. She's gone on to write many books, uh, including two nonfiction big bestsellers and several volumes of poetry. But our, uh, the poem of hers that we're going to hear is a two-part piece shared by Laura and Kate, and it's called, We Are Listening. It's about the radio telescope search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We Are Listening by Diane Ackerman. As our metal eyes wake to absolute night, where whispers fly from the beginning of time, we cup our ears to the heavens. We are listening. On the volcanic lips of Flagstaff and in the fields beyond Boston, in a great array that blooms like coral from the desert floor on high wire webs patrolled by computer spiders in Puerto Rico. We are listening for a sound beyond us, beyond sound searching for a lighthouse in the breakwaters of our uncertainty, an electric murmur, a bright, fragile, I am. Small as tree frogs staking out one end of an endless swamp, we are listening through the longest night we imagine, which dawns between the life and time of stars. A voice trembles with its own electric. We who mood like iguanas, we who breathe sleep for a third of our lives, we who heat food to the steaminess of fresh prey, then feast with such baroque good manners, it grows cold. In mind gardens, 
and on real verandas, we are listening. Wrapped among the Persian lilacs and the crickets, while radio telescopes roll their heads as if in anguish. With our scurrying minds and our lidless will and our lank floppy bodies and our galloping yens and our deep cosmic loneliness and our starboard hearts where love careens, we are listening. The small bipeds with the giant dreams. Thank you, ladies. That, that last picture was the Arecibo telescope, which is referred to in the poem, but sadly has collapsed and, and is no more. For hundreds of years, astronomers have learned about the universe by collecting faraway light, visible light at first, but then also infrared, ultraviolet, radio, x-rays, gamma rays. And very recently, they have come up with a way to intercept an entirely different form of invisible information, gravitational waves from violent events in the faraway universe, collisions of black holes. And the instruments that are used to detect these faint gravitational waves are very unusual looking. They, parts of them are miles long and they're run by teams, international teams of scientists. In 2015, when the first detection of gravitational waves was ready to be made public, the scientists went to great lengths to translate the press release into as many languages as possible so that people all over the world could hear the news simultaneously. The operator, the chief operator of the observatory in Washington state is a physicist named Corey Gray. And he is a member of the Siksika Nation, the Northern Blackfoot of Alberta, Canada. So he asked his mother, Sharon Yellowfly, to translate the press release into their language. And our next poem by Jessica Reed touches that moment, the, the detection of this faint information of an event that happened a billion years ago and the challenge of translating a high-tech scientific breakthrough in an ancient language in imminent danger of disappearing. And those two things also made her think about the way the history of Earth's climate is held in the polar ice. And that history is disappearing now as the ice melts because the temperatures are rising. So um, all of these things are braided together in the poem that Nehesayu will read for us called, As the Nude Rasmussen Glacier Calves, a woman translates gravitational waves into Blackfoot by Jessica Reed. When we first detect the chirp of black holes colliding, she renders the press release into disappearing language. Light splitter and union of instruments speak interferometer, self-strengthened lights 
exploding. Speak, gamma rays. Such subtle bird songs are undone by gravitational waves. We are compelled to fix their fugitive features. In glaciers, nature deviates and also runs its course. Its layers, not quite memory, but more like artifice, snow's structure changed under so much weight. The geometry of flakes collapses, heavy, cold, compressing air, deforming fern. The cold is a formalist. It constructs a made thing, temporary, describing ancient climate feedback as it melts. How elusive the object, how we read impermanence in layers of ice so compressed, its expansion can shatter glass, of ice so deep you can no longer discern sequence, its layers folding and sliding into the non-linear, as effortful as astrophysics in Sixica, somehow still legible. We must consider and reconsider freezing and thawing. A girl punished for speaking in her native tongue, the defiance in resurrecting an idea whose circumference swells and contracts, an artifact of water and sky, revealing the dual meanings of sublime, its magnificence, its vaporizing solidity, which I say is proof of something if it doesn't save us. Yes, thank you. This is Jessica Reed's chapbook, World Composed. But that poem is not in this collection because the poems in meter have to be new, previously unpublished. This is how the poem looked uh, when it appeared in the August issue of Scientific American. And when that happened, Jessica tweeted it to Corey Gray. And he shared it with his mother. And she said, Oof, almost made me cry. Someone is listening. At the start of tonight's program, I, I promised a poem by a real astronomer. And that time has come. Canadian astronomer Rebecca Elson was born in 1960, but she died of cancer at age 39. And in her very brief career, she did research in England, Scotland, United States. She observed at two major facilities in Australia. And she alludes to her professional travel in the, the poem that Isaac will read to us. It's called We Astronomers by Rebecca Elson. We astronomers are nomads, merchants, circus people, all the earth our tent. We are industrious. We breed enthusiasms honor our responsibility to awe. But the universe has moved a long way off. Sometimes, I confess, starlight seems too sharp. And like the moon, I bend my face to the ground, to the small patch where each foot falls, before it falls. And I forget to ask questions and only count things. Oh, thank you, Bud. Thanks all of you for joining us. It was nice to have the twin hooks of National Poetry Month and International Dark Sky Week. 
but I hope you'll agree we don't need a special occasion or any excuse to enjoy poetry about astronomy. Uh, do we have time for questions, Josh? Do we have questions? Thank you, David. We do. I am happy to say, and I neglected to say it in the introduction, but that, that you're willing and able to, to hang around a little bit and chat with our audience, which is about 200 people from all over the world. So thank you to all our viewers. Thank you to Donna McCormick and the Hamptons Observatory and our special guest, Susan Harder. And we're inviting questions or comments. There have been a lot of wonderful responses as we've been going through the night that are in the chat function of our Zoom webinar. But there's also, if you look on your Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A tool. And if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to specifically address to Deva or one of our other panelists, please write it into the Q&A function. We, we've got one in there right now, Deva, uh, from Julia M. She asks, can some early creation myths be considered astronomical poetry? I suppose so. <laughs> why not? Uh, why not, right? It, I mean, I guess the, 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 on a mythic and spiritual level, they're speaking, sure. these creation myths are speaking in a way to astronomy and the great sure. unknown. Uh, human, humans try to explain things, either by figuring them out or making up stories about them. That's what we do. Do um, I'm seeing some comments come in in the chat, and thank you very much for that. Uh, does anyone else have any particular questions? Uh, here's something from John Bates, and um, it's maybe even a question for our technical director, Patrick. But um, John Bates asks, how can we access a recording of this? This should not be one night for some only. Well, well, thank you, John. I'll speak on behalf of the production end. Um, this is John Drew Virtual Theater. And we are here live coming to you predominantly from East Hampton and some from New York and North Carolina. But this is essentially a, a moment of live theater. And those of you who are here with us tonight, like any live theater event, are capturing an ephemeral moment of time as we read these poems together and share in Dave's work. Um, there may be an archival recording that exists. So if you're really hungry to access a copy for your records or to look at it again, you can shoot an email to us at Guild Hall. You can send it to me, Josh Gladstone, at guildhall.org, and we can see about sharing the archival recording with you. But this is, like a comet, a one-shot evening. <laughs> um, there's some more questions that are coming in. Thank you so much. From Dave Zobel. Ah. Which, is hard, which is hard, which is harder to turn a scientist into a poet or a poet into a scientist? I really have no idea and no opinion. I just want to thank Dave Sobel because he, he and I are frequently confused for one another, as you might imagine. And he introduced me to Jessica Goodfellow's poetry. So, um, uh, he certainly turned me into a fan of hers. I've been a fan of science all my life. And maybe that's something uh, that you, Dave, could, could research now. I, I was tripped up, Dave Zobel and Dave Zobel. I, I definitely wasn't sure what I was reading that. Thank yep. you. Um, <laughs> there's a question here from that mythic character himself, who some of us at the John Drew Theater know and love, Trevor Vaughn. Ask, is, is there any current or hoped for poetry on the subject of dark matter? Oh, yes. Yes. The short answer is yes. Dark matter, entanglement. The poets are onto, onto all of it. And uh, with any luck, Meter will have a long life. And I'll be able to share lots of those poems on all manner of esoteric scientific subjects. Hey, Trevor. <laughs> um, another fine question from a writer comes in, writer to writer. 
And this question from Chrissy Sampson, Deva, is what do you most find compelling in a science poem submission? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. First of all, it really has to be about science. It can't just mention the word science or use some scientific idea as a jumping off point for a poem. It has to really work in that realm, but then it really has to make a poetic leap. And I think, I think we've seen a lot of nice examples of that tonight. So there, there's an emotional component. There's often a surprise at the end of, of different direction. And I always liked Emily Dickinson's definition that she knew it was poetry if she felt like the top of her head had been taken off. <laughs> Excellent. There is a couple of good questions going on in the, in the chat as well as the Q&A. Oh. Um, Deva, there's a good question here from Elizabeth, and this might also be for Susan Harder to answer if she's still with us, but the question is, what can we do to promote dark skies in East Hampton? Oh, is Susan still with us? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Good. You know, East Hampton is the only town that does not have a dark sky committee. Southampton has a wonderful dark sky committee, as does um as does the um south hold and riverhead and other towns so we need to establish a dark sky committee i'm happy to work on that if you want to get in touch with me um s harder at optonline.net let's talk to the town board and get one because there's things on the horizon that uh, we need to affect uh including um some led street lights um, we need to be careful about using LEDs at night. So good question. You know, please get in touch with me. Great. And on, on a simpler level, just turn out the lights. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Susan, for joining us. Your, your passion for dark skies has been ongoing and, and you're such a great advocate uh, for this important issue. There's a, a good question in here too. It's a sort of logistics and travel question as we move out of the pandemic and can consider traveling again. Um, but the question came up, Deva, what's the best place to view the next um, eclipse, the next event? Well, this is a great topic of discussion. And uh, I, I happen to know uh, an eclipse expert astronomer who's going to Mexico because the weather looks best there. So you, you, you want to be able to see the eclipse. You really want good weather. But the length of totality is different at different points along the eclipse track. So you want to think about that too. And then you want to think about where you can get to. And you can engage in endless discussion on all these topics and with many online references. And um, there, there's time, but, but it's time to start thinking about it. Uh, another good question. Thank you. If another good question has come up in the Q&A and it's from Marissa who asks, Deva, can you speak about your own adventure of including nonfiction, music, and now poetry to investigate the universe? Oh my, um, <laughs> my own adventure. Well, uh, Marissa is an old, I, I know it's the same one because I doubt there are two people with that name, but we, we go way back to grade school together and we were recently reminiscing about how lucky we were to see the Leonard Bernstein Young People's Concerts in person uh, at Carnegie Hall. Uh, Marissa was a, a favorite of the orchestra teacher and, and we got tickets to go. And I um, have been very fortunate to be able to write about astronomy in lots of different ways. 
Um, I don't write fiction, but I did write a play about Copernicus and some of the chapters in The Planets have a, an imaginative component. And I, I think that's fair game. I think in writing about science for a non-science audience, you, you want to be able to invite people in and make the subject feel welcoming. And that's as important as any information content. Because once a person gets interested and feels comfortable, there's no shortage of information content. So I think working through the arts is, is, is a valuable thing to do. And I'm, I'm loving doing this poetry column. Well, Deva, I think that's a wonderful comment upon which we can conclude tonight's festivities. Thank you, working through the arts. And that's what we at Guild Hall do. And it's such a great thing to partner with an organization, a fellow nonprofit like Hamptons Observatory donated their time tonight and their efforts working towards the sciences, working towards the arts in partnership together for all of our elevation. Please visit Hamptons Observatory's website as a nonprofit. They too survive and, and thrive with your generous donations. Please visit Guild Hall's website, guildhall.org, to see all of the exciting programs, other virtual theater programs coming up this month, and a live programs returning to Guild Hall to the John Drew Backyard Theater this summer. We're so excited to be bringing theater back online. And Deva and to our partners at Hamptons Observatory and to our excellent ensemble of actors, Laura Hicks, Kate Muth, Nehesayu Degans, and Isaac Klein, Deva's very own son. We thank you ensemble for your excellent work this evening at the virtual theater. Hope to see you all again. Make a donation if you can. Signing off from Guildhall, thank you.